My name is Dallas Williams, and I have one question. What does it mean to be erased from history? Why should it matter that some individuals' discoveries and events are completely forgotten aside from those performing diligent research? In the world of theater, we pride ourselves on progressiveness and inclusion, but this was not and to a degree still is not the case. I'd like to take some time to discuss some influential playwrights of the 1600s and early 1700s, which may seem unnecessary as they've been dead for 300 to 400 years, but trust me, their impact will become prevalent in discovering the unwelcomeness that the theatrical world had towards women and how the topics these women discussed in their plays are still topics we have trouble discussing and representing today. Now, you may be saying to yourself, these artists have been dead for so long, why should I care? And I'd like to address that question with this. Knowing how our craft used to be and how that has affected how we run things now is integral to being a well-rounded and successful artist. Similar to how we learn from our mistakes in our individual lives, we learn from previous shortcomings in the world of theatrics and art. Additionally, these women led extremely interesting and diverse lives Spies, traveling performances, secret pen names, scientists, philosophers, none of these women were simply playwrights and nothing more. Learning about who they were will help identify some of the messages they attempted to spread, messages which are still trying to tackle today. Now, obviously these women were not completely erased from history. If they were, there'd be no information about them whatsoever, which would make this presentation a lot more difficult. Instead, they have been excluded from the literary canon and are seldom discussed and learned, even by those studying theater arts. Their work was criticized either during their lifetimes, after their deaths, or both. So who are these women, and what did they write about, and why do we not hear about them as often as we should? This brief presentation will hopefully answer all of these questions and leave us wondering who else we don't know about that made monumental creations and discoveries in the theatrical world. Afra Ben is probably the most famous of the women we will be discussing today. Have you heard of her? In a brief biography, Ben was born in 1640 in Kent, England, and died in 1689. She is given credit as being the first female writer that made a living off of her written work. This doesn't take into account the secrecy of her early life or her brief time working as a spy in which she was either barely paid or wasn't paid at all for, nor her time spent in prison for debt in which her writing career began. Yeah. She was pretty cool. She wrote 19 performed plays during her lifetime in addition to fiction novels and books of poetry. Ben's career occurred during the majority of the height of the Restoration Era. Women were allowed to perform on stage in England, finally, and King Charles II's love of theater encouraged a society more welcoming of the art form. Ben's work was heavily criticized, both during her lifetime and after her death, as she was seen as a force to be reckoned with. So what did Ben do that caused such controversy? Well, she wrote women as real people, a startling development, I'm sure. One of her more outlandish concepts was her portrayal of female sexuality on stage, particularly in her play The Rover. The play focused on three women, a soon-to-be nun, a prostitute, and a soon-to-be bride, the three stereotypical roles that women had in theatrics up to this point. Ben portrayed all three women as pursuers of men they found attractive. This was a concept never seen before and may have caused outcry if she had not set the world in a fantastical land of carnival and concluded the play in a stereotypical patriarchal way. She most likely did this due to the fact that she had to sell her place to survive and no one would be willing to work with her had she concluded the play in some outlandish and progressive way. In addition, some of her novels and other plays discuss topics of race and slavery, leading to further deviation from the norm. She is seldom performed and learned about because of her status as a woman doing men's work and because of her stance on perceiving women as having similar desires as men, which would make men and women equal, a blasphemous statement of the time. And she's not the only playwright who has tack tackled this subject matter either. Susanna Senslever was most likely born in 1667. She left home at 15 after the deaths of both of her parents and her stepfather's remarriage. She most likely traveled with a troupe of strolling actors where she played many pants roles, but this is unconfirmed. After two marriages in which both of her husbands died within two years of marriage, she moved to London and began writing in addition to acting. She wrote plays from 1700 all the way until her death in 1723 due to illness complications. 
since Lever's work is remarkable as she became more politically vocal throughout her career and made clear stances on politics. What other remarkable feats did Sense Lever achieve in her lifetime? In 1702 and 1703, Sense Lever produced two plays, The Stolen Heiress and Love's Contrivance. What made these two plays unique was not their content nor their message, but rather in Sense Lever's decision on credit. Sense Lever wrote these plays under a different male pen name. The love scenes and female desires in these plays were interpreted as extension of Sense Lever's, or rather the male pen name's, desires. Since Lever claimed that female dramatists only found success where they, where they obscured their gender. Additionally, after some controversy with a male playwright plagiarizing her work, Since Lever wrote Platonic Lady. In it, she detailed how women writers were treated with inequality compared to their male counterparts. Additionally, Since Lever's later plays were censored due to their politically charged messages. Since Lever was tackling inequality and discrimination for win women's work long before the concept of the glass ceiling came to be, which is truly remarkable. Due to her work on vocalizing the disparity between men and women when it comes to writing and her extreme political stances, which most women did not have at the time as it was seen as a more masculine subject, Since Lever was criticized and has been put on the back burner of history. But she's not the only one. Margaret Cavendish was an esteemed playwright and philosopher. She was born in 1623 to an aristocratic family and was well-educated. She developed an extreme interest in philosophy, poetry, prose, and playwriting. She engaged all of these activities throughout her life, though her plays would not be produced until after her death. Her prose and poetry pieces helped to deliver her philosophical ideas. Cavendish was criticized for her philosophical and scientific discoveries as it wasn't feasible at the time that a woman could be educated enough to make such discoveries. She was accused of being too eccentric and of enlisting her husband's assistance in her written work despite her background in education. Would a male be criticized this harshly in this time period? What did she write about in her plays exactly? Cavendish wrote The Convent of Pleasure and published it in 1668. She did not intend for the play to be staged in her lifetime. The play covers the story of a newly wealthy Lady Happy who, who has decided to use her wealth to live in a cloister with other unmarried women. Lady Happy lives happily with the princess and several other women here. Some men try to shut the convent down, but they are unsuccessful. The women pair off romantically with one another. Lady Happy and the princess seem to fall for one another, especially. It is revealed in the end that the princess was actually a prince who ran away from his kingdom. The two are married in the end, and the convent is preserved for virgins and widows. The Convent of Pleasure is fascinating as it covers topics of gender and resistance to marriage, concepts that seem unheard of for the time period. Cavendish also incorporated a few of her philosophical ideas into some of the lines of the play as dialogue between some of the characters. The reveal of the princess as the prince helped defy public outcry. Would the princess and Lady Happy be the ones that were happily together at the end of the show? The play would not be nearly as well received. Despite the stereotypical ending, it is refreshing to see complex topics of gender being tackled so long ago, though slightly unnerving that we are still having discussions about these topics now. How much progress have we really made? And how else were these women playwrights criticized at the time? Mary Picks only wrote a handful of plays, but she was still considered a female wit of the late 17th century. What may have been seen as, as an accomplishment was quickly dismissed as an anonymous playwright, or perhaps a group of playwrights, wrote a play titled The Female Wits, which depicted Picks and two other female playwrights of the time in a satirical play intended to attack these successful women. Male artists could not conceive the notion that women were successful in their field, and their only form of defense against these women was to attack their pride. However, the fact that the author was anonymous proves the cowardice of the move. The author was most likely afraid of backlash for the attack and chose not to reveal themselves. These are but a few of the female playwrights that we no longer learn about or we don't see performed. There are more that have been brushed to the side of history, their impacts forgotten, and their messages erased from the canon. Women have been discriminated against, censored, ridiculed, and attacked in the theatrical world in the past, solely for the fact that they were women attempting to express themselves in the world of theater and spread messages about the inequality that they faced. How much have we changed since then?
Let's work together to create a world in theatrics that we can all coexist in and all can be equal. Let's work to create a theatrical world that defines the message 50-50 in 2020.